<laughs> We're back. Welcome to Nostalgia and Comedy on Black Country Extra. I'm your host, Dave Dinsdale. Welcome to the wonderful world of Dinsy. With me in the studio, we have as my co-host, comedian and actor Mikey Crump. Hello. He's friend Jess. Hiya. <laughs> and special guest, the comedian, compere and raconteur, Paul Jennings. How do you do? We should be talking to Jennings about his comedy career and experiences later. And there are some clips of comedians from yesteryear and old adverts. Firstly, I've received an email from Mary Parks of Raleigh Regis. And Mary writes, why is it that you never have any Ken Goodwin on your show? Well, it's a very good point. So to start us off this week, here is Ken Goodwin performing on The Comedians from Granada in 1973. And what about this woman that come running out of the bank screaming mo blue murder? And um, <laughs> and this policeman said, what's up? She said, an elephant's just been in and robbed the bank. He said, will he recognise it again if you see it? <laughs> she said, no, it had a stocking over it. He said... <laughs> Funny, you know, it's funny because, but you know, when I when I go shopping now and uh, and I'm not acting daft, you know, and I'm being serious and um, and, I, and I walk in and I, and, I, and I walked into this shoe shop and I said, a pair of crocodile shoes, please. He said, certainly. What size is your crocodile say? <laughs> the same trouble getting a suit, you know, I walked into this shop and I said, I want to try that suit on in the window. He said, well, you can't, you'll have to try it on in the cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> what about these two fellas in prison and they can't get out? One said to the other, how long are you in for? And his pal said three days. So he said, how did you manage that? He said, they hang me on Monday. <laughs> So they took him across to that place where they do it. And they had to, they had to, oh, they had to cross this big yard in the teeming rain. And they said to the hangman, what a rotten day to go across here. And he said, you should worry, cos I've got to come back in this yard. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> he said, have you got any last request? He said, I'll keep your trap shut. <laughs> He said, I'm not kidding now, this is your very last chance. <laughs> he said, all right then, would you mind putting the rope round my waist cos I've got a boil on me neck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What about, what about that uh, fella that died and, and, and his mate went to see him and he stretched out there in this box and he said to the widow, he said, he doesn't half look happy, you know, cos he was smiling. <laughs> 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 she said, ah, oh, wait till he wakes up, we don't know he's dead yet. <laughs> I'll never forget, though, because, you know, when you don't have much money. And I remember my mum saying, now I can, she said, go to the butchers and tell him he wants a sheep's head and ask him to leave the legs on. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this fellow with a long face, and I talked to anybody, me, that I talk back, and I said, I, I said, um, what's up with you? And he said, I'm not going home to our house. <laughs> I said, aren't you? He said, no. I said, why aren't you going back? He said, there's a terrible smell in our house. <laughs> I said, is there? <laughs> he said, aye, the wife keeps cats. <laughs> I said, well, have you tried opening the window? <laughs> he said, what, I'll let all my pigeons out? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Nostalgia and Comedy Show on Black Country Extra. You know, there's there's people these days who wouldn't get that. Were you a fan of King Goodwin, Paul? 
Yeah, I was. Yeah, it, it got it got a good persona, and it got that sort of ridiculousness about it. So the audience loved him anyway. But they were kids' jokes, weren't they? Yeah, but I mean, you look at the people that are doing it now. I thought about this about these one-liners that they do now: Tim Vine, yeah. uh, Gary Delaney, people like that. And they go, oh, they exalt it as like this beautiful new art form. Well, really, it's just as childish and just as ridiculous and just as perishing funny as when Ked Goody was doing his stuff. Well, there's mm-hmm. nothing new under the sun, is there? Absolutely, <laughs> no, absolutely not, absolutely not. I mean, people say funny is funny. Mm. And that's true. And I know there's a minefield now, you know, about all you offending people and all the all that the usual stuff. Political correctness gone mad. <laughs> But that funny is funny, mm. and and what tickles you now tickle people a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, or whatever. You know, well, that's one of the reasons we have this show because we have a whole vault of these old comedians, and people won't understand them. They won't know them. There's people like Freddie Parrotface Davis, and you don't even know who he is. No, and I do not. <laughs> Sounds and, good though. And he was he was um, an old style comedian, but he told a joke about a man with a parrot, so he had to put on a silly voice to do it. And on the back of that, he created a character called Samuel Tweet at his own show on BBC Kids Television, and became an absolute superstar for Rocket. Did Rocket? Did Rocket? Did he? And he's still going. Is he? He is still going. He's over eighty now. Brought out his book a few years ago, so I've got a copy of that. I was just thinking about Ken Goodwin, because um, I'm not too familiar with his work, but at the end there, it reminded me of Duncan Novell. Uh, you know, the way... Really? You, <laughs> chase a little bit the chase way... me, chase me, Blue. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why, but the, the catch in the end of that there, it sounded very much like, oh, you know. Like, <laughs> and just the way he kind of laughed at his own joke, it just reminded me of that. Oh, he did, he did. He did used to like to laugh at his own jokes. The last um, film I saw with him in was called Treacle, which is from 1998. Uh, and it's actually up there on YouTube, and it was a film made by a guy called Peter Chelsom, who also wrote Funny Bones. Remember Funny Bones with Lee Evans? Yes. So that was about a, a promoter looking for a new style of comedy, and then yeah. he discovers Lee Evans. Well, the prototype was called Treacle, and the promoter in that film was actually Ken Goodwin. And in both films, Freddie Parrott, Faith Davis, appeared. See, it's all linked, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. This is marvellous. It is, and we're very honoured to have uh, the wonderful Paul Jennings. Paul Jennings has been going for many, many years. Uh, and we want to explore the old days, what it was really like. So what year did you start and how did you actually get into it? I started, um, right, I started doing it properly. Well, by properly, I mean actually going out and doing it in front of a paid audience. My three-minute open spot <laughs> uh, was at the Bear at Bearwood. Ooh. Uh, yeah, cracking venue. And it was the late 80s. Yeah. Um, so that's 4X Cabaret. That was the 4X Cabaret <laughs> with Frank Skinner. I'm such a name dropper. <laughs> uh, Frank Skinner and his then-manager, Malcolm Bailey. Mm-hmm. And I went up and I did three minutes because, I mean, you know, my day job, what my day job was. I do, yeah. I was, in the, I was, a, I was a police officer. I was Not police just officer. in the police service? No. No? No. Uh, are, you, are you able to say what particular division you worked in? Well, the one thing I did, well, for five years I was an undercover paedophile. <laughs> um, <laughs> which... It's true. <laughs> was, Aren't they all undercover, though? That's I the was point, an undercover have you, have, you, no, 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 have you broken cover now? No, <laughs> the good guys. Is that your, is that your leg? Um, <laughs> now, the good guys are, are sort of undercover. The bad guys are undercover, but for various reasons. Mm. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was good. And it was, oh, how can you do that? But it was, it was, it was just brilliant work. Well, it is a very serious job, so was the comedy a bit of a release or just something you've harboured since childhood? I have tried to find humour in every waking day of my life um, because that's, that is my way of coping with it. You do it to cope with embarrassing situations or, you know, dark situations or anything like that. You know, I could ramble on for about five minutes about uh, registering my late mother-in-law's death. And it's not a, not like a Les Dawson, my mother-in-law, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> like, you know, but I don't think you've got long enough to do that um, at the moment. I mean, if you want me to get, talk about it later on, I will. But, yeah, I was undercover paedophile, and um, there was, we used to have um, 
Undercover Officer of the Year awards, which is great if you're a drug dealer or, a, you know. <laughs> but Paedophile of the Year, you know, you didn't really get to wear a T-shirt saying, oh, I've won Paedophile of the Year. Well, is, that, is that like winning an award for being Spy of the Year? Doesn't that sort of spoil the whole point? Oh, it was a very, very close thing. You oh, couldn't okay. tell. I'll I tell you what, I was, on a BBC, I was on a BBC documentary and because of the work that I was doing, my face was pixelated out. Um, it was a, a sort of interview situation. My face was pixelated out, right, went out, you know, and I felt, I felt quite a little bit chuffed, like, you know. And, uh, until my mother, the, 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 mother, the day after it went out, said, did you see Apple on the telly last night? You know, <laughs> which totally defeated the fact that my face was <laughs> pixelated out, really. <laughs> yeah. So, so what type of act were you doing for your three minutes? Oh, my God. It was... <laughs> And this is this is a, this is a lesson for anybody that's doing comedy or writing books or anything like that. Do what you know. So I did what I knew, yeah. which was being a bit of a thick, stupid black country bloke, um, but coming out with ridiculous stuff. Um, I didn't do rambling stories. You've only got three minutes. It was just dink, 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 silly stuff. I didn't pinch anybody's jokes. It was just me being me. And I walked off the stage. And a bloke, I always remember this bloke, he'd got like a, a sort of hippie sort of uh, ponytail and all that. And, and the room was rammed, you know, absolutely rammed. And he dug me in the ribs and said, uh, good gig, man. Mm. You know, which I don't know why he was talking in a Californian accent. <laughs> he was in Bearwood. But, and I felt, I felt a thousand feet tall. Because I was doing stupid stuff in the police, you know, doing end of year yeah. uh, little sort of, uh, entertaining, you know, anything like that, you know, four or five of us would get up and do little bits. And this girl that I work with, who is now a solicitor down in Hampshire, um, talked very nicely. Uh, she said, uh, what are you doing? She came from the student background. She came from university and she came to the police. And she said, well, why, don't, why do you try and do stand-up? So I did. And that's that's when it took off. But were you always funny as a kid? You know, did you make? I don't know if you got siblings, but have you had any siblings? And did you have a big family? Did you make them laugh? My eldest sister Lydia uh, is eighteen months older than me, and she looks like uh, Patricia Routledge, <laughs> <laughs> and she acts like Molly Sugden naturally, <laughs> honestly, honestly. Um, and we used to spark off each other, and it's it is the black country thing. You know, you have got that dry sense of humour, and I was always the clown of the class. Yeah. In fact, when I was at nursery, we went to the primary nursery, uh, my sister used to wet herself whenever I went near her because she never knew what I was going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. So there was always that element of surprise and kind of like, you know, just a bit of a prankster. Yeah, but I didn't sort of go out of my way to be a prankster. He's a funny bloke type of thing. I was just like that. Just soft. Saf, totally, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll play a bit of Tom O'Connor in a bit because he talks about that, talking about true, li true life comedy. And really, Tom O'Connor was the precursor for Peter Kay. He was the, have you ever noticed, do you remember, play up your own end, that type of thing. Now, I first discovered the bear, I think, in 1991. So Frank Skinner had already become famous and gone away, moved down to that there London. So our compare at the time was Alan Davis. He was now possibly more famous as an actor now than he was as a comedian. Absolutely fantastic bloke. So the people from the previous season, people like Lee Evans and... Um, Joe Brand used to do the bear. Yeah, actually, I think, yeah. Carolina Hearn. So I didn't get to see any of those people. And it was very rare that we would have an open spot. And I remember one time somebody turned up, I won't mention his name, but he turned up with this papier-mâché fish which he had on the side of the stage, and he bought a camera, so his camera was on a tripod in the middle of the room, and he was introduced as this new act, and he was only doing five, ten minutes, and I think within about three, four minutes, the whole audience had turned against him, <laughs> and open spots at the time just didn't do really well at the bear, but you say you did OK? I absolutely... This is honestly total true. I, I, I stormed it. If you can storm something in three minutes. You know. Oh, you can. Um, well, I did, darling. <laughs> um, I actually did. And, and, I mean, I, I didn't sleep all that night after. No. You know. 
And because of that, Malcolm Bailey, yeah. he used to sit at the back, you know, the small bar. Oh, at the he back. did, yeah. He used to sit at the back. With big, his friend, Mr. Duffy. Yeah, yeah, big bear of a man. Yeah. And uh, he said, right, I'm going to put you on the circuit. Well, I, was going to, I was going to ask what happened next. So it was just a case of it worked the first time and said, right, you will be his star. It was like doing your um, Royal yeah. Command performance, your Freddie Star bit. Hmm. And by Monday, everybody in the country is talking about you. Not quite. No. Um, because I... Who, you've heard of the word hubris. I have. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, hubris. I then went down to the Fleece and Firkin with uh, Frank Skinner and some sort of roadie bloke. Um, to the Fleece and Firkin in Bristol. Yeah. And because um, I was... Um... Were you a bit too parochial? No. Oh. No, no, no. I just wasn't funny. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> but I did... Instead of sticking with the, the, the three-minute... I mean, you know, you, this is what you learn along the way. Instead of sticking with the three minutes yeah. that... Um, and then adding to it as you go on with yeah. the diva, I completely changed the act and did a totally new three minutes. Oh, OK. And we've all had, anybody that's performed has ever had that type when your top lip sticks to your teeth. Mm. Uh, I had that. <laughs> and it was awful. And I walked off to the sound of my own feet. And it was... That doesn't happen to me anymore, not since I've got these new trainers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't walk off, you just stop there till people laugh at me. Well, well there, there is that thing, less is more. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it sort of knocked my confidence a little bit. Uh, and then I got back into it. After that, but I was still on the circuit. But uh, so explain to us what was the circuit at the time? <sighs> what was the circuit, London? Ah, oh. so what's that downstairs at the King's Head? There was the King's Head. There was the Comedy Store. Tottenham there was, Shive. Yeah, yeah, there was all that sort of stuff. Stories about the Comedy Store. Though, yeah, well, the Comedy Store. <laughs> comedy was, Cafe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the Comedy Cafe. But the the thing with the Comedy Store is it used to open late. It yeah. was part of the Raymond Review Bar building, wasn't it? And you had loads and loads of drunks in. <laughs> and I suspect that's why... It's like comedy now. Yeah. yeah it's just like, yeah. <laughs> but, but in those days, it was a blank page because it was a new wave comedy. Yeah. Yep. You know, it was like the punk scene. It was new wave comedy, all these... And they could play angry people because it was expected of them to be angry and pushing the envelope and breaking, you know, new boundaries. They weren't. They were just doing the same, the same sort of funny stuff. But in a... A more modern way. Were they yeah. more political down London way? That was it. I mean, can I mention Ben Elton? It you was the era. That was the era when people only had to go, Maggie Thatcher, water, 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 and everybody go, hurrah, you know, and mm. sort of, you know, so, and so it became very, very turgid and samey. But the style, Ben Elton, I would imagine, I would suspect, and you, you don't compare, you know. Uh, he, he adopted his aggressive street yep. style to deal with a heckler. You hit yep. him first, yep. you know, not literally hit him first, but you hit him first, you know, and keep on top. You know, Alexis Sale, I would imagine, did it exactly the same. And his accent and the fact, you know, he was a, he was an angry working communist. That type of thing, you sort of sort of lent itself. But the, but the times we were living in, yeah, you know, the 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 eighties and all that, when everybody was angry against the system. And it just tapped into that sort of uh, zeitgeist. Well, Frank Skinner disappeared to London, as we say, and went and joined the telly world. Uh, and by 1993, in Birmingham in the West Midlands, basically all the the pub gigs had dried up. Yep. There was there was almost nothing. Did you ever do the retort? No. At uh, Edgbaston? No. Nope. I think that was the only one going then. So when you were doing your time, which is... We're talking now 1989 to, say, 90, 2002. Sorry, 1990. Where am I talking about? Yeah, 1992. Mm. Where were the gigs locally? Locally at the time, um, not many. Really not many at all. You, the Manchester. Yeah. Manchester was a, a burgeoning scene. Uh, London, obviously. And you got your gigs from sort of like around that area, you know. You, you do, you might do the odd gig uh, in the Midlands. I'm struggling to think the, the ones around Birmingham. There was the Barton Arms. Was there? Yeah, there was a gig at the Barton Arms. I know. I know. Yeah. I know. We brought it back. I did. I did a gig back there. There was Cafe Reza, which used to be Jonglers. Yes, Broad Street. Yep, Broad yeah, Broad Street. There was yeah. that one, and there was the one. Where was the other one? Did you ever work for Reg Nice? I did, yes, yes. So was that down in Sturchley? 
Yes, there was that one, and that, that was the pub. What was the pub name? Well, it's the, the Hibernian now. That was it. I tried to find that. I, I, the first night I ever did that was the Hibernian, yeah. and, and I, it was spelt, said over the phone, yeah. right? And I, 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 I got it phonetically wrong in my head, and yeah. I went to totally the wrong pub. Okay. But the Hibernian, <laughs> the Hibernian was a cracking, yes. a cracking venue. Yeah. You know, and from that. You just got even, you know, you work, but Manchester was the place. Manchester, right? If, if I can, if you will indulge me. The, the difference between Manchester and, and, and Birmingham was you go up there and you do the gigs and it'd be a proper sort of uh, three act sort of set type of thing and uh, maybe an open spot, but normally just the three act thing <laughs> and good quality gigs. Um, a lot around Man uh, a lot around the student area, Fellfield and around that way, and up Oxford Street. But you'd look to your left, and there'd be about six, seven, eight off-duty comedians yeah. just come to watch. Yeah. And they would encourage each other, and you know, and not to nick acts or anything like that, but to encourage each other. And you'd come, and they would give you, you know, constructive criticism if you asked for it. But basically, it was just like a brother stroke sisterhood type thing. Mm. And we don't seem to have that round here even now. Uh, it's it, disparate, isn't it? It's it of... is di <clears throat> good, yeah, disparate. It's, it's definitely better than it was. There are, totally better there than are it a was. couple of comedy magazines that came out in the mid 90s, and I've got all the copies, and I really should have bought a copy with me today. And each week, the magazine would go to a different area of the country and talk about the comedians and the local scene. It had pictures of them, so they had Northern Ireland when Paddy Kielty was coming through. Yeah. And they had Leeds and they had Manchester and they had Liverpool and they had London. Yeah. And on the Birmingham one, you've got Sean Percival and Annie Robinson. Sean Percival. But other, yeah. other than that, they had to have big pictures because there wasn't anybody. No. Nope. And they had one act on there. They didn't even have a picture of him. They just had to put his name up. Mm. And Birmingham, this is what I'm saying, that back in 1992, 93, and this is when the Glee opened uh, in the Arcadian, we had nowhere. No. We had nowhere to perform. No. But tell us about, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. Before we do that, tell us about your student gigs on the canal. Ah, right, yes. These, yeah, it was, it was like, um, yeah, it started this, right, to set the scene, this was before Gas Street was renovated. And by that I meant before they actually cleared all the dead dogs and, and derelict barges out of the way. <laughs> Cliff Richards, Take Me High. <laughs> yes, yes. That, <laughs> it's a yes. great film. It it's was a filmed. great film. It was filmed, yes. It certainly was. Bless him. Oh. So, yeah, so we started off at the Crescent Theatre, the other side of Gas Street, and there were two narrowboats, and the premise was two narrowboats uh, filled um, down the sides... It was covered narrowboats and licensed. And you would set off down towards Selly Oak, the student area, and there'd be uh, three acts on. And they would follow in tandem these narrowboats down the canal. And you'd start your set, walk the two steps, three steps down into the, the body of the boat. Ta -da, da, 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 you know, do your set, jump off, run along the canal towpath, and then jump onto the other narrowboat and do the same set again, and then turn round mm. by Selly Oak, by the university, and then go back up. The, the, and it was, it was pretty good. <laughs> but you did, did, didn't you say that you did theatres back then? Yeah, there was theatres, you know, there the, the were theatre gigs, yeah. The, the, because, right, the, the, the pubs had big function rooms upstairs, but there were big theatres as well. I mean, John Marshall, Agraman. Do you know yeah, Agraman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bloke that discovered Peter Kay, basically, and yeah. he's in Peter Kay's book. Um, he would give you, um, get your gigs all across the northwest and the north, uh, the mid uh, sort of north, across to the east coast, to Scarborough and all that. And he'd book proper theatres. And you'd go in there and there'd be like 300 people, 250, 300 people. And it was and it was run by people that knew what they were doing. So did you do the social clubs and the British legions? I've done enough of those, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and ad hoc, you know, not wheel tappers and shunters type stuff. <laughs> but I've, I've done, yeah, I've done, you did all those. You right, know. well, I think we'll talk about them next. You're listening to the Nostalgia and Comedy Show 
on Black Country Extra with our special guest Paul Jennings. We'll be back after this commercial break to talk about the good old days. Woolies have cut 35p off a hundred of their hottest cassettes. Queen. Tell them ready. Barry White. Gladys Knight and the Pips. Status quo. Rod Stewart. Join the cassette browsers at Woolies. Get 35p off. James Lost. Johnny Mathis. Bob Dylan. Fat Back Band. Ten CC. Manuel. And every one of a hundred of Woolies' hottest tapes. That's the wonder of good old Woolies. Look, Look for the, the money off sticker. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Some people find that most quick snacks are a little too quick. Snap. And they're gone. Twix gives you more to bite into. Crunchy shortcake biscuit topped with caramel, covered in creamy milk chocolate. Next time, get the longer-lasting snack. Twix. The longer-lasting snack. A great ball game that's swinging everywhere. Play it to win, play it for fun. For any time, for anyone. Everyone, swing ball. I'd like to introduce you to Honey Monster. Mummy. I'm not his mummy. <laughs> now, to help a honey monster through the morning, I give him breakfast, including sugar puffs and milk. Tell him about the honey mummy. Pieces of natural wheat, puffed up and tasting of honey. Honey, the taste of honey. I love my honey. I love my mummy. I love my mummy. So, if anyone asks why sugar puffs taste so good, remember... Tell them about the honey, mummy. This kind of job's one big sweat. You're hot, sweaty, you've got B.O. You may not know it. Down you come, Carol. But they do. Get him some life, boy. Life Boy gives you a clean start, strips off dirt, washes away the bacteria that cause B.O. So you come out clean and ready to go. Life Boy knocks out B.O. and brings you closer to people. The Vicar and I are so grateful for your help with the fate. So kind. Anyone could say the same for the coffee. What did you say? Well, it is rather bitter. Have you tried mellow birds? Mellow birds? Yes. Birds makes a much kinder cup of coffee. See, no bitterness there. Julie, I think you've converted me. Mellow birds will make you smile. They call him Mr. Show Business. Bruce Forsyth, the master entertainer. But what's he really like? Sunday Mirror writer Colin Wills tells you tomorrow. You'll love the real Bruce in the Sunday Mirror. The Prime Minister, Mr. Callahan, gives his first interview. Don't miss this important exclusive in tomorrow's Sunday Mirror. Girls, they're taking over everywhere. A super picture special. Lollipop Men, is there something wrong? Disturbing facts. Cup final, the real lowdown. All in the marvellous Sunday Mirror tomorrow. I'm changing to the Sunday Mirror. Slap fence panels for ten ninety nine, and Spear and Jackson's forks and spades for nine ninety nine. They're doing a six foot patio door for one hundred eighty nine ninety nine. Tetratex brilliant white for six ninety nine, and this Timberloy aluminium extension ladder for thirty nine ninety five. Every week, the Do It All computer checks prices all over the country, so nobody does it better. If only we knew it, I'd do it all. Lollipop men, is there something wrong? The disturbing facts. <coughs> Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Welcome to Nostalgia and Comedy on Black Country Extra. We've got our guest here, Paul Jennings. We're going to talk about the, the legions and the social clubs. Uh, I didn't do particularly well at the legions and the social clubs. First social club I did, uh, I, was in the, uh, I was in the gents. And a guy came up to me and said, you know, they've got a blue comedian on tonight. I went, no, oh, there's kids in this place. He went, no, oh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. He said, oh, I'm not having that. I said, I'll tell you what, if he does any blue material in front of those kiddies, let's have him. He went, yeah, with you, mate. So then they introduced the act, and he's all there. He's all there at the side of the stage, ready to punch someone, and I walk on, and he went, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. But you say you did the social clubs, did well? Um, 
Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, that's not being that's not being sort of vain or anything like that. But yeah, but the, the thing with social clubs and British legions as an entity is, by and large, the audience all know each other. It's not like a comedy club where people, you know, you've got disparate groups of people and different mindsets, but they all go to enjoy comedy. The social clubs and, and like, the British Legions and stuff like that, they're the same audience that just go for a pint uh, on a night time and you are just the entertainment for that night. Do you find those kind of gigs a lot tougher? Do you find those... Or do you, do you find that, you know... Because it, it's kind of pack mentality, isn't it, with those kind of audiences? Exactly, exactly. It's like a less drunk stag night, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the best way to describe that. Any comedian listening in would know exactly what we're talking about. Um, if you can get them on there on your side, and we talked, we spoke about Freddie Paddleface Davis. That man only had to stand on the stage, and he'd got the people on his side straight away because he looked funny. Lee Evans again, mm. funny, looked funny. So you're part way there, and, and the audience started to accept him like that. Um, so if you go there and it's pensioners' evening and you just happen to be the entertainment and they've got a few spare rows of people that want to come uh, to see a bit of comedy, you've automatically got to divide there anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, um, but get them on your side. I mean, younger people struggle at places like that than, say, me. Yeah. You know, but there again, I could turn up there and a, a group of students might have booked the... the I, I can't think there's only going to be any time that that would happen, but, say, a group of students had booked the Royal British Legion for a night just as a venue, I might struggle. I mean, I did a student gig, and this is the gospel truth, where even the bar staff were heckling me. <laughs> <laughs> Lobbing bottles. <laughs> that is bad, you yeah. know. I misjudged the audience, and the worst bit was I, I had a blinding uh, gig the week before up in Hull with a bloke, Queen McDonnell, who's now a published author. Oh, he's Bless brilliant, him. isn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. really good mates of Gary Delaney, and and, I had this, and and he looked at me with almost godlike awe, I'd like to think, <laughs> or, or utter bemusement. <laughs> now, but I had this really good gig, and we chatted after, and then, and then, the following week, I did the gig. And he, he was there on the bill as well. And the look of utter disappointment on his face. So I felt I'd let Queeve down. So and you've fall, fallen from, yeah, yeah. from grace. Well, this is it. I mean, you're only as good as your last gig, aren't you? Well, that's I the shame. I, I noticed when I was doing stand-up, I realised that there was... I don't know if it was like a bad luck thing, but there were certain people in the audience that I'd always have a good gig in front of, so they'd book me. And then there was always people I'd always have a bad gig in front of. I was always... They'd never see me do a good one, so they just thought I was rubbish, would never book me. Um, mm. You, I'd never let Jess come and see me do gigs, so I was rubbish no. in front of her. Um, but I think, what do you think is the difference then? If you say, say, you know, a younger a younger person might not go down so well at a social club or the British Legion and things. Um, so what's the difference between your sort of material and, and theirs? What's the what's the kind of gap there? Right, uh, references. Yeah. You know that word runs through the whole comedy ethos, doesn't it? References. Um, I could use references that. Okay, right. For for argument's sake, um, the Twin Towers. Yeah. Um, there's a big conspiracy theory going on about the Twin Towers and all that. Remember that, you know, like it was done, it's CIA and Bush and all this sort of stuff. And I said, well, I know the only person that could ever do that was Fred Dibner. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Tumbleweed in a crowd of a certain age. Absolutely. Because thinking, who the heck is Fred Dibner? You know, but, you know... To a certain age upwards, it's fine. They're pitching it, isn't it? Yeah. Pitching it right. Now, if I said that in the British Legion with a normal British demo, uh, British Legion demographic, you know, chuckles all round, a few scratched heads, but chuckles all round, you know. Other people, you go and start quoting sort of Instagram and blah de blah de blah and, right you know, and, and, and Fortnite, you know, Fortnite. Go, <laughs> or as it's known in the Black Country, two weeks. But <laughs> <laughs> the Fortnite game and everything, you know, you get the, so that, that, the older demographic of go, what the heck is he? And then you become, you start coming across as being a smart aleck mm. and you start lo losing the audience. And then once you start losing the audience, you know, again, top lip sticks to your teeth. And uh, yeah. It's the hard part. It's the, it's the dry heaving before a <laughs> 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 
Oh, yeah, we've all heard that. We've However, that. you say that about the, the difference between the older and the younger crowd, um, but the older crowd is starting to move its way into things like TikTok. So there's uh, the the sounds and the, the kids will do a little dance or whatever to, to a sound. And Victoria Wood is one of the sounds. Um, the chip shop, down at the chip shop. Uh, so, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I heard it, I was like, I know who that woman is. And I said, I've sent it to you, haven't I, Mike? Mm. Every time I see it, I send it to you. And these kids would never know what, what it was from. They just think it's just a funny thing that they do, but it is... It's still hilarious now to a different generation, just as hilarious as it was back then. Which gets us back to what we were saying earlier on, you know, at the start, funny is funny is funny, you know. Absolutely. Um, the, the beautiful, without sounding too sort of trite or whatever, and that's the beauty of the performing art, like comedy or any performing art, it, it can transcend generations and, and persuasions and all sorts of stuff, and it you can unify, but you've got to let the people tune into that. And once they tune into it, an old person will laugh at the, the yep. TikTok, TikTok stuff just as much as the young people will, and you know, vice versa. And now we'll get Victoria Wood, who to me was a genius. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I love her so much. She's brilliant, wasn't she? Let's do yeah. it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. It's that karaoke song. <laughs> that is actually, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, I mean, if you play an episode, like we were talking earlier about, say, uh, Porridge or Faulty Towers or Only Fools, if you play an episode of those to somebody who's, you know, 15, 16, I mean, they'd still laugh because it's st- funny, it's funny, it's about character, it's about, you know, you know, not just Times, gag rates. isn't it? Yeah, those sorts of things are funny. Um, but then you know, you see a lot of the older generation don't really find kind of newer comedies funny, you know, so like Fleabag and things like that. Fleabag's brilliant. But isn't it, isn't oh, it brilliant? brilliant? Amazingly brilliant. Very, very well written, you know. Mm. I mean, the stuff she's written, you know, uh, Jodie Comer with all that, what was that called? Killing Eve. That's Killing the Eve, one. Yeah. You know, she's fantastic. And it was that, Fleabag was absolutely brilliant. Dark. Dark, yeah, very You know, dark, dark dirty... Funny, you know, chuck it all in the mix. It was brilliant, you know. I thought it was great, yeah. I showed it to my granddad and he said, Where's the laugh track? <laughs> <laughs> you just don't get it. To Where's, the laugh track? Where's the laugh track? I can't watch it now, son, turn it off. He don't get it at all. Um, but what was I was also going to ask you about, uh, because obviously we were talking um, when we had the break, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, you know the kind of late 80s, early 90s when you were uh, mingling and gigging with these people who became household names later on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how was that? Did you have a feeling that the people you were working with and gigging with would become these kind of, you know... Superstars. Superstars, which is a strange thing to think. It's like, you know, oh, me sitting here with Dinsey today and then tomorrow he's on... My jaw was on the floor. Would... I was just sat here, like, in awe of, like, oh, my goodness, because I only know names like Frank Skinner as a as a TV star. But you knew him when he was... And people like that when they were just starting out. Well, that's it, but the, the, there's the, the, the that's the danger of deifying people, isn't yeah. it? They say never meet your heroes. These people are still the people that they were. It's mm. just that they're older and they've got more money. The talent, <laughs> the talent's always been there. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, yeah, when I was, when I was on the circuit with these people, um, first of all, you were just grateful that you got through your gig yeah. w- 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 without dying on your bottom. <laughs> um, and also, they were just people that you're gigging with. There were certain ones that you would think they are really good and are really... I'd love to just sit and watch them and learn from them, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the danger with that, the danger with that is that you, you might copy their style and that's not you. Yeah. You know, I think we've all, when we've done the, done, been doing comedy, have tried different things and it just doesn't fit you. Yeah, you've got to be original and authentic to yeah, yourself. But, but to get back, yeah, that's absolutely true. Because then you start feeling more comfortable and it becomes and become more believable. Yeah. So yeah, when I was seeing these people, you know, gigging with them, and yeah, you thought some of these are good. Uh, some of the ones that have gone on to bigger and better things, I've thought, how the heck did you get work? <laughs> it's a look thing, isn't it? You know, this is this sounds very arrogant coming from a bloke that you know. You know, drives a a, a a ten year old CRV Honda. You know, <laughs> um, but some of these people, how did they get work? And how did they continue to get work? But there's people still on the, on the circuit now that are quite famous that have just mm. sort of broke. You think, why are you? Why are you like that? Yeah. Well, let's go back in time and. Listen to one of the old stages. There's another act who actually started his life on The Comedians, on Granada, back in the 1970s. Had a very successful career on game shows uh, and then did the cruise liners. Uh, Wonderful man and a man who really speaks from the heart and it is Tom O'Connor. 
I, I toured. I did South Wales, the North East, the Midlands, uh, Yorkshire, um, and they were all totally different to the Liverpool scene. Because uh, I said the North East particularly, they'd had everybody. And this Geordie chap said to me, what you want to do is talk about your home. He said, get up there. He said, don't tell us about miners when we know them. He said, tell us about the dockers, tell us all the things. And it's amazing, of course, once you start that, they can identify with it and you're telling the truth mm -hmm. and you're enjoying yourself. Now, that's the key, I think, to comedy. If you look as if you're enjoying what you're doing, the audience will enjoy it as well. You've settled them down, you see. Uh, and, and, of course, I built from there. I had to go home to get an act that could then export. I had yes. to go back and look at home first, you know, <laughs> and get all those, those true stories that I do in my act now. <laughs> It's not like it used to be, is it? Do you remember years ago when people were happy? <laughs> remember them days, eh? We were poor, but we were happy, weren't we? Eh? The good old days. When you could go to somebody's house and they'd say, Come in, help yourself. And they had nothing. Do you remember the old days? <laughs> when we were small, ah. Tell you, it was a better world when we were small, wasn't it? Do you remember? Yeah. When you were five... Dif different world when you were five. <laughs> right? When you could play in the street and the women came out and shouted at you. Do you remember that? <laughs> Go on, you. Up your own end. <laughs> we did, didn't we? <laughs> you like your mother, you are. <laughs> Them were the days. I'm sure the kids of today don't do the things we used to, do they? Eh? We did silly little things, didn't we? But I tell you what, we never went punk, did we? <laughs> God love those kids. Have you seen them now walking about? Half a welly on one leg. <laughs> Pins in their noses. Hair like a lodging house cat. <laughs> Who gets them ready now? <laughs> One of them said to me, Grandmother, they didn't have rolling stones in your time, did they? She said, No, but there was a lot of diphtheria. <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> we never did all that, did we? When you couldn't wait for your first school holiday, because you had it all planned, I'm staying in all day with me toys and playing. And your first day off school, your mother would say, Come on, picnic. <laughs> <laughs> Middle of December, come on, picnic. <laughs> and you had to go out, you remember, to the bomb site on a picnic. <laughs> Did you ever go on the bomb site? Like with a little packet of sandwiches and, and a big bottle of water between nine of you. <laughs> And if you were smallest, you got last swig. <laughs> when it was your go, it was floated in breadcrumbs. You know? <laughs> and you had to prove you were tough by not wiping the top of the bottle. <laughs> the kid before you had that purple ointment on his lip. <laughs> We're back. Welcome to the Nostalgia and Comedy Show on Black Country Extra. I'm Dave Dinsdale. We have Jessie Clare with us. Hello. Hello. We have Mikey Crump with us. Hello. And we have the comedian, compere and raconteur Paul Jennings telling us about his start in the comedy business. So we're going back now to early 90s, late yep. 80s. What was your best comedy gig? Mm, top of my head, uh, it, was a, it was a charity gig. And it was... Do you remember the that thing, Make Poverty History? Yep. White wristbands and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I don't think that's really worked. No. No, it hasn't. <laughs> didn't, no. Ca didn't catch on. Well, <laughs> good idea, didn't catch on. I think, I think Marx and Engels tried a little, you know. <laughs> they wrote a bit of a book. But it was in all the shops. Um, but, yeah, no, Make Poverty History. And I got the call and uh, I went on stage, proper theatre... Uh, rammed to the gills, this place was. And my opening line was, uh, when I got the call, I jumped at it because I thought they said, make Coventry history. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that got, got me on side. It wasn't in Coventry, by the way. And, uh, yeah, and, it was, and I remember stopping um, halfway through my set and it was going that well. I said, I absolutely love this. 
and and just and again the audience even love that like you know uh, yeah. I've gone goose pimply thinking about it look. yeah and it was great and and you know that charity gig was that good I'd have done it for nothing <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that <laughs> you'd pay good money to listen to this I, I got people listening to this they'll be right they'll be writing that down be writing that down so Mike have you done the charity gigs yeah yeah or have you done charity gigs in a theatre. Uh, in a theatre? Charity gigs I've done haven't been in a theatre. They tend Churchill, to be in they? a social club or a really rough pub. Yeah. And I always liked the charity gigs because I liked the idea of giving something back. <laughs> the reality is that they were terrible because they're uh, an audience there to support the charity who probably don't know comedy. No, they don't want to like, They don't want to sit down and stop talking. No. Uh, the one I've done two that are memorable. One was in like um, some sort of church hall, and just before I went on, um, these group of lads come up to me and said, "All right, uh, listen, our boss is sat at the front, and uh, we want you to kind of go up to him and have a bit of a laugh with him and flirt with him. We've had a bit of a camp act to go and flirt with him and have a laugh." And I thought, "Yeah, right, I'll sit on his lap and <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit on his lap and I'll, I'll get this audience right on my side." And uh, as I come out, I looked out into the audience and it was just a row of women and one man just sat in a wheelchair. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I can't. Imagine me running up to him and just jumping on his lap. I did. I did make it. Sure the brakes are on. But, yeah, make sure his little... And I didn't know what to do. Um, I just, I was, yeah. And there was one where me and Danny Clives went to this place in Evesham and it was uh, like a social club type place. And um, it was just like a, like a disco. There's some woman playing like ABBA and... Uh, shaking Steve and stuff and like proper going for it and these kids were all dancing and skidding on the floor and balloons everywhere and we just got up in the middle of it just to do a set of comedy and the microphone wasn't on properly and nobody was laughing and people were shouting stuff yeah. and it was... people think it's like the television yeah like they think you get up you say something and people laugh it's real life isn't like that no it was terrible I mean I had one I mean this isn't really a funny story but there was a a guy had both legs shot off he was only 21 mm. both legs shot off in Afghanistan Came back and they did this charity gig, so I thought we'll do that. And he was actually a very good gig. But all his mates came up and said, just make some gags about his legs. <laughs> going, going, no, no. That's, that's not that's not what we're here to do. And the, the microphone didn't work. No. There's about 300 people in there. I had to stand on a table. And my lungs aren't good at the best of times. So I'm on this table with 300 people surrounding me, so it's 360 degrees. Trying to do some kind of comedy show. That was that was crazy. So yeah. a, any more? Good gigs. Mm. Yeah, I've had a lot of good gigs. Should we concentrate on the bad gigs? Yeah. I, I mean... We say the bad gigs till last because it's the stories about the bad gigs that people want to hear. <laughs> right, OK. Uh... No, actually, I, I will jump in here because we do have a very memorable gig that Paul and I appeared at. I won't say the venue... But it's in Cradley Heath, <laughs> and I, and oh, I, no. I was the regular compare there, and we had this drunk guy at the front, and I was, I was giving him a bit of. Was that the whatever. landlord? It wasn't the landlord okay. this yeah. time. All right. <laughs> uh, and I was, you know, I was doing my job as the supposed compare, trying to keep the place in order, and then he got up during the break to go to the gents, and he went to the wrong side of the door, so he was looking for a handle on the wrong side of the door, so I went to help him see where it, where he needs to go and he just looked at me and said, said you should have said what you said and he took a swing at me and I felt the fist just breeze past my nose Paul Jennings was actually at the bar and obviously with his police training this guy was out in the street within four yes. seconds <laughs> Love a bit of that. and it was good though because the people kept coming back the following week because they wanted to see the same thing again <laughs> <laughs> they, they were just hoping that next time he would connect Yes. So, yes, yes, the bad gigs. The bad gigs, oh, my goodness me. Uh, oh, right, again, microphone's not working. Uh, I did, a, I did a, a, a festival, music festival. And, of course, you know, people turn up. The clue is in the title, music festival. <laughs> <laughs> they don't turn up for comedy, but they thought, oh, we'll put some comedy on, so this tent. That'll work. Oh, yeah. That'll totally, work. Totally work, yeah. And... So all the people, all the there were loads of stoners there, and they all went off to go and see some weird psychedelic band uh, sort of play in the main field, and they left all their toddlers and kids and that 
in this place, in the tent, and we had to entertain them with about six local farmer boys that had been on the scrumpy all day. <laughs> And it just wasn't... At one stage, uh, a female comedian, a, a, a kid runs on the stage and smacks her backside. <laughs> you know. Uh, and But I, I managed to get round it by including the drunk in the gig. Mm. So he was heckling me, and I'm and so I, I got him, and I'm saying, well, I'm letting you in now. Let's call him <laughs> Jethro for all of <laughs> <laughs> or, or Zeke, or something like that, you know. Clayburn. And um, I said, I'm letting you in now, I'm letting you in now. And I let him speak, let him speak. And they said, right, I'm shutting you out now. And I just carried on like this, and it became part of the act. And it went down really, really well. So that's not a bad gig, really, is it? So, no, so Well, it was for him. It was for him. And it, his mates <laughs> in the end... sobered up, yeah. His mates in the end just started humiliating him. Yeah. But we couldn't get over the fact that, that, that um, there was just loads of kids there. And they didn't get any references, apart from sort of pampers, nappies and stuff like that, and, you know vomiting over your mother's shoulder you know <laughs> there was nothing else and it was absolutely ridiculous but people think oh we'll put a comedy venue on and they don't think about it do they you know they don't think that perhaps it's not the best place to do comedy no. music festival i did one once where um up in leicestershire where it was a big nightclub and there were three big settees on the stage and there was a big one of these punch ball things where you test your your, your punch strength, yeah. And that was behind. That was that was at the back of the room, and they kept that on all the way through people's acts. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so it was kind of boom, ting, hey! <laughs> you know, uh, which was great if you could time your punch lines to the boom, that, ting, that, hey! yeah, you know? yeah. That's that, that would work. But I went on and said, "This is the first time I've ever done a gig in in the window of World of Leather because of these." <laughs> <laughs> we set ease well on there, you know. But well, we have all done those. We have done those with the television on in the background and people yep. waiting for X Factor and whatever. Yep. yep. I see, it's incredible. I did a licensed victuallers one in Redditch where the licensed victuallers uh, availed themselves of the four hour free bar before we went on. That was a total disaster. <laughs> if I could have committed Harry Carey in front of everybody, you know, I think I would have done that night. It was terrible. And then this one woman, um, I, 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 it wasn't a tasteless joke. I, 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 I did, I just mentioned Tourette's. And this woman uh, got very, very upset because uh, one of her relatives had got Tourette's. But she sort of slipped into Tourette's mode while she was around. <laughs> the, and I, I did say, I did say, oops, it looks like it runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> She didn't see the funny side of it, to be quite honest. You know. but, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a tragedy. What about heckles? Heckles. Best heckles you've ever had. Best heckles I've ever had, right. <laughs> uh, Alexander's. Have you ever done Alexander's in Chester? Chester. Yeah. yeah. Alexander's for the unofficiated, unin unofficiated, uninitiated. It's a weird setup, lovely, lovely venue. It's a long, narrow venue with a small stage at the end of it and the bar over to your right and at the back. There is no MC, compare, whatever. So the second act brings on the first act. Mm. The headliner brings on the second act, etc., etc., etc. So there's no real warm-up. You know, they get the value out of you. Um, and it was a hen night to the left. A uh, load of Liverpudlian women, got to love them, especially when they've got a drink in them. And a load of blokes dressed as vicars. And I made a fundamental error. I got everybody sat down, and they were a bit rowdy, but I managed to calm them down, got them down, and they were, they were quite sort of well-behaved for drunken people on stag nights and hen nights, and the, the, these blokes were dressed as vicars. Anyway, this bloke lurches to the front from the bar with two pints in his hand, and he sits right down in the front, uh, in front of me. And before he sits down, I said... Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, can I get you anything, like a watch? You know, usual sort of stuff. And I said, I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm going to say you're not a real vicar. And I made the mistake of leaving the microphone by his mouth, and he said, I'm going out on a limb, and I'm going to say you're not a real comedian. Oh, no. And I just felt... And the crowd erupted, and I just said, fair enough. <laughs> but then he said, but he did say... He Leave said, with dignity. Yeah, yeah. He says, he says, you're going to beat me up now. I said, no, I'm going to destroy you with words. 
and I did. But we ended up mates, and we had a pint at the end of it. That's wonderful. That's a nice, that's a nice ending to the it story. Is, it is a nice it could, ending. Could have story. gone worse. What's that comedian, the Australian one who got lamped at the oh, comedy yes, store? What's his name? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Jeff. Oh, Jim Jefferies. Jim Jefferies, that's Jim it. Jeffries. Yeah. I worked with him in Coventry. Actually. No, I did you? Nice, no, good bloke he is. He was, yeah, very funny. He told a joke which I cannot do on this station for various reasons, and um, <laughs> half the women walked out. Oh no, no! And the ones who stayed just glared at him for the rest of his. Because he, he does the one about the gun law and everything, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's right. Oh, that always become an internet sensation on the back of it. so that. funny. I've seen, so funny. I've seen loads of people walk out of Louis Schaefer's shows as well. All the, does anyone want to leave? Anybody want to leave? You, 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 you hate me because I'm a Jew. You hate me. <laughs> <laughs> you hate me. That's what he's like all the time. You he could do a tribute act. With that, with that. that was good, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've just watched him so many times and drank with him so many times. Yeah. Mike, Michael, no, no, you hate me. You hate That's all he does. Want to get a bagel? No. Oh, yeah. That's it. I love him. I don't know why I thought of him, but um, I'm glad you did. That's it. Yeah, that yeah, Louis Schaefer, mate. Really good. Um, I think the worst heckle I ever had was somebody said, uh, "Have y'all got AIDS?" <laughs> and after I didn't say anything, I just walked <laughs> off. But I wish I'd have said, "Yeah," and I caught it from your dad. <laughs> oh! <laughs> but I didn't. Think, <laughs> but I didn't think about it. But uh, oh yeah, that was in tips, and I think somewhere. <laughs> really, I'd have liked that he tipped it. Actually, he'd have said that. Yeah, I caught it from your dad. Which one? This, is, this has been great fun. <laughs> this has been great fun. We've, uh, we've got Paul Jennings here. Unfortunately, once again, we've run out of time. So we're going to have to have Paul Jennings back and we'll, uh, we'll continue this. So, uh, Mikey, goodbye to you. Goodbye to you, bit. Jesse, goodbye to you. See you later. Paul Jennings, goodbye to you. Ta-ta. I've been Dave Dinsdale. You've been listening to Nostalgia and Comedy on Black Country Radio. Good night to John Boy. I hope you've enjoyed <laughs> the show. 